We are reading in book three, the book of the Divine Mother, Canto three, the house of the spirit and the new creation. And we are still in the first section, which as it often is, as we go through the poem, the first section is a kind of linking section, which links the current canto with the previous one. So what we read last week is that having had this vision of the Supreme Divine Mother, um, Asvapati realizes that a greater task remained than all he had done. And that in order to be able to embody that power and purity which he has glimpsed, um, which he's longing to be one with, still there are some obstacles in his nature. Despite everything that he has done, there are still some traces of human weakness. And um, so we saw how um, he has made an enormous effort <coughs> described in line 51 he tore desire up from its bleeding roots and offered to the gods the vacant place so in this way he becomes able to bear that immaculate touch that touch of ether and of fire um, Sri Aurobindo says somewhere else that absolute, that touch of absolute purity, immaculate, without any imperfection or impurity. So as a result, a last and mightiest transformation came. We have seen a succession of transformations happening for King Asvapati as he proceeded on his yogic journey. And here Shobindo tells us this is the last one and the most powerful one. So that is what a description of this transformation and the state that it brings about in Asvapati is what occupies the rest of this section. So I will read to the end of the section. Let us see how much we can study today. <laughs> <coughs> His soul was all in front like a great sea, flooding the mind and body with its waves. His being spread to embrace the universe, united the within and the without to make of life a cosmic harmony, an empire of the immanent divine. In this tremendous universality, not only his soul nature and mind sense included every soul and mind in his, but even the life of flesh and nerve was changed and grew one flesh and nerve with all that lives. He felt the joy of others as his joy. He bore the grief of others as his grief. His universal sympathy upbore immense like ocean the creation's load, as earth 
upbears all beings' sacrifice. Thrilled with the hidden transcendence, joy and peace. There was no more division's endless scroll. One grew the spirit's secret unity. All nature felt again the single bliss. There was no cleavage between soul and soul. There was no barrier between world and God. Overpowered were form and memory's limiting line. The covering mind was seized and torn apart. It was dissolved and now no more could be. The one consciousness that made the world was seen. All now was luminosity and force. Abolished in its last thin fainting trace, the circle of the little self was gone. The separate being could no more be hid. Sorry, the separate being could no more be felt. It disappeared and knew itself no more, lost in the spirit's wide identity. His nature grew a movement of the all, exploring itself to find that all was he. His soul was a delegation of the all that turned from itself to join the one supreme. Transcended was the human formula. Man's heart that had obscured the inviolable assumed the mighty beating of a god's. His seeking mind ceased in the truth that knows. His life was a flow of the universal life. He stood fulfilled on the world's highest line, awaiting the ascent beyond the world, awaiting the descent the world to save. A splendor and a symbol wrapped the earth. Serene epiphanies looked and hallowed vasts surrounded. Wise infinitudes were close and bright remotenesses leaned near and kin. Sense failed in that tremendous lucency. Ephemeral voices from his hearing fell, and thought, potent no more, sank large and pale like a tired god into mysterious seas. The robes of mortal thinking were cast down 
leaving his knowledge bare to absolute sight. Fates driving ceased and nature's sleepless spur. The athlete heavings of the will were stilled in the omnipotence, unmoving peace. Life in his members lay down vast and mute, naked, unwalled, unterrified, it bore the immense regard of immortality. The last movement died, and all at once grew still. A weight that was the unseen transcendence hand laid on his limbs the spirit's measureless seal. Infinity swallowed him into shoreless trance. So we'll go back to line 55. Which way are we reading today? Rosa, you start. Hmm? <coughs> His soul was home in front like a great sea, flooding, flooding her mind and body with its waves. His being spread to embrace the universe, when united the within and God without to make of life a cosmic harmony and an empire of the immanent divine. Thank you. So the, the soul is usually behind, working from behind, but now with this last and mightiest transformation, his soul is all in front, like an ocean, like a great sea. And that soul is flooding the mind and the body with its waves, the waves of that great sea. Everything is filled, flooded with his soul. And his being, his, we can even say his individual being, has spread, it is spread, enlarged to embrace the whole universe. Mm -hmm. It's able to unite, to bring together what is within and what is without, what is the inner and the outer. And in that way, to make life into a cosmic harmony, a universal harmony of the whole cosmos, everything in its place. an empire of the immanent divine, the indwelling divine. The divine is immanent in everything. There's nothing in which the divine is not dwelling, but the divine is not always, the immanent divine is not always active, is not always ruling, 
It acts through the instruments, through the nature, with all its limitations and imperfections. But now when the within and the without become one in the soul, the whole of life becomes an empire. It is all ruled by the indwelling divine presence. In this tremendous universality, not only his soul nature and mind sense included every soul and mind in his, but even the life of flesh and nerve was changed and grew one flesh and nerve with all that lives. Let's pause there. Hmm? So his being has spread to embrace the universe. So in this tremendous universality, it's not only the soul nature and the mind sense, which is embracing all the other souls, all the other minds in his sense of oneness, but even the body is participating, even the life, of flesh and nerve is changed and grew one flesh and nerve with all that lives. Mother speaks about this experience in the agenda. And I think she says that it's the loss of the ego sense even in the cells of the body. experience the matter outside the, the, at least the living matter he feels one his own flesh and nerve it's not separated anymore it feels and exp in the same way that one can feel one in sympathy in the heart with all the emotions and one can feel one in the mind with all the and the noosphere, all the thinking atmosphere. Now even this life of flesh and nerve feels its oneness. We know that all this is one, even on the material level, you know, but we don't experience it like that. But that is King's, King Aswapati's experience described here. You know. And. Um, we know that Shobindo has written a couple of poems, one sonnet and another short poem about this experience in the late 1930s when he says, I, can, I experience in myself the bombs dropping in uh, Canton and in Barcelona and uh, I carry the, the sorrow of millions in my breast. He felt the joy of others as his joy. He bore the grief of others as his grief. His universal sympathy upbore immense like ocean the creation's load as earth upbears all beings sacrifice. Great is the hidden transcendence, joy, and peace. Mm. It's not easy to bear the joy of others as one's own and the grief of others as one's own. It, in fact, is not possible unless it is being born by the divine presence in us. Mm. So that, that is his experience. He feels the joy of others as his joy. He bears the grief of others as his grief. And this universal sympathy of his is supporting, bearing up the whole load of creation. You know, to some extent, you can feel the joy and grief of 
Uh, to a small extent we can feel it, yes, yes. But if you start to think about experiencing uh, the, the joy and the suffering of every human being on earth, uh, you can't, uh, you couldn't bear it if it came to that, no? What can bear it? What can bear it is the hidden transcendence, joy and peace. That which is beyond all this, is able to bear all that. And then he gives this interesting simile, no? that uh, this sympathy of King Aswapati, it's immense like ocean, and it is like earth. This earth consciousness, this earth goddess, is holding up the sacrifice of all beings. This is a, a very, uh, this is a Vedic idea, you know, that every movement of life is part of the sacrifice which is offered by the earth to the higher consciousness. You know. And here it's as if the earth is uh, holding up uh, the offering of all these multitudinous experiences to the higher to the higher levels and because it is offered up then an exchange comes blessing comes down so that's um priority offers to the pushka hmm? the priority offers to the pushka we can say prakriti offers to purusha, purusha yes earth offers to the supreme and this meaning of the word sacrifice when Sri Aurobindo uses it, it's very, very different from the meaning that it has in Christian thought and in Western thought. Uh, the Gita tells us, with sacrifice as their companion, the Lord has created all these creatures. It's so, sacrifice doesn't mean something, losing something, not like that. Uh, it means this interchange which is always going on, this interchange of energies through which um, we, we grow and we progress. So he's able, his being is able to upbear all that, that immense complexity of joyful and painful experience because He's thrilled with the transcendence, joy, the delight of the transcendent, and above all, the peace of the transcendent. Hmm. We'll go on, Francesca. Yeah. There was no more divisions, endless scroll. One grew the spirit's secret unity. All nature felt again the single bliss. There was no cleavage between soul and soul. There was no barrier between world and God. Thank you. So that endless scroll, this never-ending story, of division, of separation, it has just vanished. It's not there anymore, this sense of division and separation. Instead, the oneness of the spirit's secret unity. Everything is secretly always one, but now he has the full awareness of that oneness. And he experiences that this is not only in himself, this is in all nature, that uh, everything is experiencing this single bliss, as if all the divisions between soul and soul, they are gone. There's no barrier, there's no separation of any kind between God and the creation, the world. overpowering experience of the oneness.
Yuli. Former powers were formed and memories limiting life. The covering mind was seized and torn apart. It was dissolved and now no more could be. The one consciousness that made the world was seen. All now was luminosity and force. Yes. So the forms are still there, but they are no longer limiting. They are not bringing about a sense of division. And similarly, memory. Memory is one of the greatest individualizing powers, that our memories are different from other people's memories. It's a kind of... And then there are many things we don't remember. No, so. But all those limiting lines are just overpowered by this experience of oneness. And the mind which veils the direct contact with reality, the covering mind, it's just seized hold of by the soul, by the oneness, and torn apart and dissolved. It couldn't cover anything anymore. It couldn't exist anymore, that covering separating, limiting mind. Because the one consciousness that made the world was seen. Everything, everything that he can be aware of in the whole universe, it is luminosity, shining with inner light and force power, energy. Would you like to read? Abolish in its last thin fainting trace the circle of the living self was gone. The separate being could no more be felt. It disappeared and knew itself no more. Lost in the spirit's white identity. Yes. Of course, we have seen in um, earlier stages of uh, King Aswapati's yoga that the, uh, the ego's ring could join no more. It's, he's not cut off in the way that we are by this limiting ring of ego sense and that uh, the island ego joined its continent. We, we are told earlier on. But here, that uh, circle of the little self, the limiting circle of self, just disappears. No? The separate being could no more be felt. He can only feel oneness. The separate being has disappeared, doesn't recognize itself any longer because it's lost in this experience of the wide identity, the oneness of the spirit. That, list, that, that circle of the little self has been abolished. Uh, when you abolish something, you just cancel it out completely so that it doesn't exist anymore. Even the faint, the last thin uh, trace, fading trace of the little self is, has gone. It's not there anymore. Mary? Is nature room a movement of the all, exploring itself to find that all was the this soul was a delegation of the all that turned from itself to join the one supreme. Mm. <coughs> so nature and soul are two aspects of our self-experience. You know? He sees his nature now 
everything that connects him to the, to the evolution, to the rest of the universe, is a, grows a movement of the all, of the whole of the rest of nature, his nature, his individual nature and all its experiences. He sees it now as a movement of that one nature, universal nature. And that one movement has been exploring itself, exploring nature and other nature to find that everything is himself, was he. Hmm? Was he with a capital H, the supreme also. Hmm? And that other side of uh, selfhood, the soul, he sees as a delegation from the all. Uh, a delegate, a delegate is somebody who's sent to represent uh, a group of people or a body. You know? So he's a delegate, a delegation, something that's been sent to represent the whole universe and it's turning away from itself and its nature to join the one supreme who is beyond all the universe, beyond nature. Joel. Transcended was the human formula, man's heart that had obscured <coughs> and available assumed the mighty beating of a god's. His seeking mind ceased in the truth that knows. His life was a flow of the universal life. Mm. So the human formula, this particular form of body, life, mind, with all its limitations, he's gone far beyond that transcended, he's gone far beyond that. So this human heart, man's heart, that had obscured, that had hidden the inviolable, another uh, word that Sri Aurobindo uses to evoke the Supreme. Since we can't limit the Supreme with our um, descriptions, our descriptive words, very often he uses a negative, the unknowable, the ineffable, the immaculate, and here he says the inviolable, the one that cannot be wounded or damaged or hurt in any way. So a man's heart obscures that unwounded, unwoundable one. But now in King Aswapati that human heart is changing, it's beating, it assumed the mighty beating of a god's, like the heart of a god that isn't uh, so limiting and which doesn't obscure the inviolable but expresses it. Mm -hmm. The seeking mind which is part of the human formula, ceased. They just stopped because it has entered into the state of truth that knows. There's no need for seeking anymore. His life has become a flow of the universal life. Uh, would you like to read? Is it Laura? Would you like to read? <coughs> you try. Hmm? He stood full fill from the world's highest line, awaiting the aspect beyond the world, awaiting the best thing the world to say. Hmm. So there he is on that highest level. You remember we saw on the mother's diagram there's a kind of line separating the manifestation 
from the beyond manifestation. So there he is, fulfilled on the world's highest line. He's awaiting the ascent to go even further beyond the world. But he's also awaiting something from beyond, a descent, something to come down to save the world. That is his purpose and his aspiration. Alex? A splendor and a symbol brought here, serene epiphanies look and hollow pasts surrounded, wise infinitives were closed, and bright remotenesses clean, near and kin. Yes. So here we've got all these plurals in this sentence suggesting that there are many presences are felt around him. But the earth is wrapped, it's enveloped in a, in a splendor, a wonderful light and glory and a symbol. The, the earth is a powerful symbol, it's only as a symbol that we can understand or begin to grasp the real significance of our earth. Hmm? So as if blessing the earth, these serene epiphanies looked. Serene, it's such a beautiful word. It means uh, calm, peaceful, smiling at the same time. Hmm? Epiphanies. Again, this word has a, a Christian connotation. It's a, a Greek word which is, I think, similar to revelation. Here in India, we have the word darshan. When um, you know, the, the divine reveals, shows himself in a form. And this Christian festival of Epiphany, which comes, uh, I think it's the twelfth day after the birth of Christ. No? Uh, it's the day on which um, the, the, the wise men came from the East and they recognized in this Christ child the Divine Presence. No? So this is, this is Epiphany and that's, uh, that's the special day from which all the sacred days in the Christian calendar are calculated. Mm -hmm. So, but here it means presences, showing themselves, looking, divine presences, serene divine presences looked. And hallowed vasts, hallowed, sacred, holy, Vastnesses, no, vasts, surrounded the earth. Wise infinitudes were close. I think this is one of the words that Sri Aurobindo has brought into English. Is infinities, we, we know this word, but infinitudes, he has uh, uh, created this word. Inf Finitenesis. It's, it's a beautiful sounding word that he uses in his poetry. So these infinite presences are close and bright remotenesses, things that have been distant, far away. Remote means distant. No? These bright, distant presences leaned near. They are blessing the earth, they are near and kin. Our kin are our close relatives, our family. So those things have appeared very distant, but they're closely related to the earth. And now they're coming and giving their, the blessing of their closeness. Linda? Yes. 
Sense is the way that we relate with the material world through our senses. But in that tremendous flood of light and oneness, or the light of oneness, we can say, of the one consciousness, this necessity for sense as a way of relating to something outside, it just failed. It's no longer there. There's nothing like sense. So one of the senses is hearing. This uh, feeling, this hearing of ephemeral voices it means the, the voices of the material world or of maybe the also subtle worlds that, don't, that are not eternal, that are short-lived. They fell away from his hearing. He comes into a kind of silent state. And the power of thought, even cosmic thought, is, has no more power. So there's this wonderful picture of as if thought is a powerful God, but he's lost his power. He's become tired. He sinks into these mysterious seas of uh, consciousness that doesn't require any kind of thinking. <clears throat> Mahalingam. The robes of mortal thinking were cast down, leaving knowledge bad to absolute sight. Faith dying sees a nature sleepless for the athletic feelings the will, still the omnipotence, unmoving peace. Yes. So these mortal thinkings, they're like robes, coverings, no? Now those robes are cast down, leaving his knowledge. The knowledge is there, it's exposed, it's bare to absolute sight, to a power of absolute vision. In, in our lives, we feel the driving of fate, of things that seem to be decided and that we have no control over, that we can't help or do anything about. That sense just stops. There's no feeling of that compulsion anymore. And this way that nature has of poking us, driving us, always to change, to have more experience, even this stops. A spur, you know, it is what the, the horsemen wear on their heels to, to drive the horse to go faster. That sleepless spur of nature. We, we are allowed to rest at night, but even then there's, nature is spurring us on as soon as we wake up in the morning. That spur is there, it's with us all the time. You know? That stops. The athlete heavings of the will. King Aswapati has an immensely powerful will. He's even an embodiment, we can say, of will and aspiration for the higher states of consciousness. And uh, the will, he says, is like an athlete somebody who makes a great effort and uh, has to drive his lungs and his heart and his body. But those athlete heavings, that tremendous effort, all this is stilled. It's all the, the, the driving of fate, the sleepless spur of nature, the heavings of the will, all this is stilled, become still and silent in the omnipotence, unmoving peace.
the all-powerful doesn't need any of that to achieve anything that he wishes to have done. This unmoving peace. Force one with unimaginable rest. My teacher Amal Kiran often used to quote this line from one of Sri Aurobindo's other poems. He said that seemed to him an ideal state of dynamic peace. No? Force one with unimaginable rest. Uh, Patricia, you're hiding away at the back there. Would you like to read? Yeah. Life in his memories lay down vast and neat. Naked, unwalled, unterrified, it bore the immense regards of immortality. Mm -hmm. So the life in his body, in the parts of his body, is also at peace. All that energy lay down. It's also become vast and mute, silent. It's also without any covering, without any limitation, unwalled. And it doesn't feel terrified or troubled by that release from form. It is naked, exposed, it bore the immense regard of immortality. The look, immortality, the state of immortality is looking at the life in King Aswapati. If The last movement line or a house blues team. A way that was the unseen transcendent and laid on his limbs the spirit's measureless seal. Infinity swallowed him into shoreless tracks. Yes. So everything is stilled and silenced. Even the last little movement dies. Everything is still unmoving. And he feels a weight, a pressure. He doesn't see, it's the unseen transcendent's hand. There's a pressure from what is beyond all form. It's that pressure is felt on his limbs, on his body but it's putting the pressure of the spirit, the spirit's measureless seal. The king puts his seal on something you know, to show that it belongs to him or that he has approved it. So there's this pressure, this touch is there and he gets uh, all his sense of uh, it's of everything gets swallowed up into this shoreless trance. A trance where there's no border of any kind. It's the trance of infinity. So the description of that going into trance, no, it starts here with this last line on page 309, sense failed in that tremendous lucency. It's uh, this, this process or this uh, aspects of uh, coming into this state of trance. And the rest of the canto tells us about his experience in that state of trance when he moves into, uh, he's able to, to perceive another state that's completely beyond our universe. 
So that's a good place for us to stop today. We'll go on. The story continues next week. So shall we take the last five minutes and read these lines that we've just studied? We go back to, uh, um, I think we'll read uh, line 54. Our last and mightiest transformation came. His soul was all in front like a great sea flooding the mind and body with its waves. His being spread to embrace the universe, united the within and the without to make of life a cosmic harmony, an empire of the immanent divine. In this tremendous universality, not only his soul nature and mind sense included every soul and mind in his, but even the life of flesh and nerve was changed and grew one flesh and nerve with all that lived. He felt the joy of others as his joy. He bore the grief of others as his grief. His universal sympathy upbore immense like ocean the creation's load as earth upbears all being sacrifice, thrilled with the hidden transcendence, joy and peace. There was no more division's endless scroll, one grew the spirit's secret unity. All nature felt again the single bliss. There was no cleavage between soul and soul. There was no barrier between world and God. Overpowered were form and memory's limiting line. The covering mind was seized and torn apart. It was dissolved and now no more could be. The one consciousness that made the world was seen. All now was luminosity and force. Abolished in its last thin fainting trace, the circle of the little self was gone. The separate being could no more be felt. It disappeared and knew itself no more, lost in the spirit's wide identity. His nature grew a movement of the all, exploring itself to find that all was he. His soul 
was a delegation of the all that turned from itself to join the One Supreme. Transcended was the human formula. Man's heart that had obscured the inviolable assumed the mighty beating of a god. His seeking mind ceased in the truth that knows. His life was a flow of the universal life. He stood fulfilled on the world's highest line, awaiting the ascent beyond the world, awaiting the descent, the world to save. A splendor and a symbol wrapped the earth. Serene epiphanies looked, and hallowed vasts surrounded. Wise infinitudes were close, and bright remotenesses leaned near and kin. Sense failed in that tremendous lucency. Ephemeral voices from his hearing fell, and thought, potent no more, sang large and pale like a tired god into mysterious seas. The robes of mortal thinking were cast down, leaving his knowledge bare to absolute sight. Fate's driving ceased, and nature's sleepless spur the athlete heavings of the will were stilled in the omnipotence unmoving peace. Life in his members lay down vast and mute, naked Unwalled, unterrified, it bore the immense regard of immortality. The last movement died, and all at once grew still. Away that was the unseen transcendence hand laid on his limbs the spirit's measureless seal. Infinity swallowed him into shoreless trance.